Hey everybody, this is Caleb, part of the Narrate team. Today is part one of a three-part series called Three Things. Three things that we wish everyone knew about the church. When you think of church, what comes to mind? Do you think of a building, maybe an institution? Today, Adam takes us all the way back to the beginning of the church and what it really is. Top of the morning. How are you? I have all these anecdotal things going through my head, and I'm trying to resist talking about all of them, but I am going to talk about one. Uh, did you notice we had a new guitarist? Um, don't, don't you really want to know how long his hair was when he was 30? <laughs> Isn't that really what's going through your head? We're, we're, Rob, we're, how long was your hair when you were 30? I know you're in here somewhere. Or maybe you're not. You just play the guitar and leave. Well, I don't know. But we need to figure out, because he had to have had hair down to the middle of his back. Because I'm guessing that would have been the 70s or so, right? So anyway, uh, the other thing, anecdotally speaking, is um, so on the 4th of July, I was in Billings and I tore my last contact. And so I spent a good few hours in Costco begging them to just give me another contact, which was kind of like getting a meeting with the president. But eventually I was able to get another contact. And so then I, I had two contacts and I've been telling myself I need to get to the eye doctor. And uh, I have an appointment tomorrow at 2 o'clock, and I tore my last contact I was, as I was taking them out last night. So if you choose to um, mock me or in any way ridicule me from basically about the fourth row back, no big deal, because I can't see you anyway. You're just a blob of stuff. Uh, this morning, what I'd like to do is tell the church's story. Uh, which is kind of an audacious goal. And by the church, I, I don't mean narrate, and I don't even mean our association of churches. I don't even mean the church in Helena. I, I don't even mean the Western or even the modern or even the Protestant church. Uh, when I say this morning the goal is to try to tell the church's story, I, I mean like the church, like the Catholic church, which, by the way, before it was a denomination unto itself, it was small c, just simply meant universal. Like this morning, I, what I'd like to do is try to tell about 2,000 years of church history in about 30 minutes. So you may miss the Bronco game this afternoon. Uh, and I want to do that because I, I suspect, and I, even after last service, it was very affirming, I suspect that many of your stories are like my story, and that is that at some point in your life, you became fascinated by Jesus, maybe even made a decision to start following Jesus. Uh, and then somewhere along the path, it seems to happen five or six years into someone's experience with Jesus, you began to ask these really audacious questions about the church. And you reached this point where you came to the realization that you really had no issue with Jesus. In fact, uh, you admired him greatly, maybe even followed him, maybe even were allowing him to be Lord and kind of director of your life. And yet you came to the realization that your issue was with, like, the organization, uh, the, the institution, the, the, the building like this one, the, the association like this one. And that's what happened to me when I was in my mid-20s. And what's odd about it, and I would suspect that some of you can relate to this, I hadn't even had a necessarily negative experience up until that point. I, I had a really good Catholic upbringing at 19. I got really serious about following Jesus in a, a four-square church. I was working for an evangelical church when I was 25 years old. Like, I, I'd had nothing but good at church experiences. So they weren't coming from this place of like, ah, bunch of jerks, bunch of hypocrites, none of that. I just reached this place where I was like, Lord, I think maybe I could like do the kingdom thing. I could live the kingdom life more effectively if I didn't have all the busy work of the church. And for me, one of the more, uh, one of the things that captures it as, as well as anything is we, we had this old house in downtown Billings and our neighbor was in her 80s, she was a widow, she was homebound, she had medical staff that would come visit her and meals, uh, meals on wheels and all those different things. And, and I couldn't help but notice that the paint was literally falling off of her house. And I couldn't help but notice it because it was also falling off of my house. And so I spent years painting that. And, and I would say to myself, I'm sure you have areas in your office or people in your life that you do this with too. I would say to myself, man, someday I'm just going to go paint that lady's house for her. I mean, me and a few of my buddies, we, we could knock it out in a weekend or at least this one particular side that was as bad as it was. And when I was kind of having my crisis of church moment, I, I was, it was when I came to the realization that I'd been saying that for a couple years now. And the irony was that I was so, the way I started to articulate it was I was so stinking busy doing church that I didn't have time to paint my neighbor's house. And so I, I real honestly was beginning to go like, Lord, I think maybe I could get a job in the marketplace. I called it laying in the weeds. I'll just go lay in the weeds and serve people like all these people that I deeply respect. But before I did that, I, I started to uh, read books and ask questions 
and, and, and study things out. I, like many of you, had lots of friends in my life who loved church and lots of friends in my life who hated church. I, like you, was well aware of the fact that if you do follow Jesus, one of the easiest ways to start a conversation is just to criticize the church. Because we even have this thing, the church. We're like, we don't even know where it is. Like, where's the church? We just, there are these passing, these massive generalizations, and it's so easy to spark a friendship and a conversation on those critical comments. And so I just was like, okay, before I go there, I want to engage the text. I want to engage the scriptures. I, I want to read some books. I want to trust some of my other friends. And, and what, I, what, I, what happened is what I now say I became familiarized with the church's story. And in a very real sense, like that experience led to the planting of this particular church, not, not as a reaction, in fact, quite the opposite. But in the process of that, I, I so began to appreciate the, the, the role that Jesus had for the church and his kingdom and his movement that it caused me to swing 180 degrees in the other direction and instead of go, I'm, I'm going to walk away from it to, in, in many senses, give, give my life to, to, to helping lead one. And so I suspect many of you can relate. In fact, uh, you're, you're one of those people, and maybe you're there right now. Maybe you've worked through it, but maybe, you're, maybe you haven't, and, and maybe even the people closest to you, uh, they, they don't even know that you're there. Maybe your, your spouse is freaked out that, that you're there, and let me just be clear on this. My, my goal this morning is not to overwhelm the conversation so that I can win. That, that's really not the goal. More than that, what I want to do is, is, is give some more information that, that further illuminates the conversation. Not, not that I could win it. Now, obviously, I'm biased. But, but more than that, that, that your conversation could be that much more uh, deep, maybe even informed. Some of you are here, and, and quite frankly, uh, you, you hate both the church and Jesus. And the reality is you're, you're maybe not even entirely sure why you're here. Maybe you're here, here out of respect for them. Maybe you're here because... Uh, your, your wife moved out. Maybe you're here because you've, you've had some situations in life that have caused you to be more vulnerable than you normally would. Maybe you're just here because you heard about the series and you're, and you're curious. And again, my, my goal is not to necessarily persuade you or win the conversation. But I do think that if, if only one thing comes out of this conversation for you this morning, it's this, it'll have been time well spent. I think where it starts for you is, is, is to name them. Because the reality is organizations don't hurt people and churches don't hurt people and institutions don't hurt people and businesses don't hurt people. Uh, People hurt people. And for you, maybe the most helpful thing in your spiritual journey would be to, to name them so that it's not a general, it's not a, it's, it's not a generalized idea, but you're dealing with something that you can actually deal with, which is a conflict And maybe for you, the question this morning is, are you going to continue to allow that hurt, that thing, that person, which may or may not have been legitimate, to continue to define the rest of your spiritual experience, the the rest of the conversation? Some of you, uh, you you, you love this place. You're where many of us were at one season in our life. Maybe this is the first church you've ever had. Maybe this is uh, the first church you've had in a long time. But but, but you, you, you love Narrate. And for you, the tension is you might think we're too perfect because please don't misunderstand me. I am not suggesting like we're doing it, we're the model, come follow us. That that is the furthest thing from the truth. In fact, I think for you, the challenge of this series and in particular this morning is to know the bigger context because the reality is we're not out of the woods either. The reality is uh, that we could very easily become the institution that, that many of us want nothing to do with. And I think you need to have the right information or or enough information to know when we get there so that you go find another church. That if it happens, uh, you you go somewhere where they are fleshing it out. So what we're going to do, we're calling this series Three Things, as in three things that I wish everyone knew about church history. Uh, For those of you that like history and you like big story, I think you'll be engaged. For those of you that don't, we'll see you in October. Uh, But it's three things, as in three things that I wish everyone that I knew, I found myself going like, man, there's people in my life, there's family members in my life who I know have moderate interest in Jesus. I wish they knew this about his church. There's people in my life who I know who love Jesus and hate the church. I wish they knew this. There's oftentimes I'll find myself sitting across the the, the table from people who, who are struggling, whether it's with an occupation or their finances or their marriage or whatever, and I'll find myself thinking, 
man, I just wish that you understood Jesus' vision for the church because everything would be so much lighter for you. Not, not easier, but, but more bearable, perhaps. So I think we start here. When you hear the word church, what, what comes to mind? I think it's important that you would understand that. Is it a gathering? Is it an hour on Sunday? Is it the most boring hour of your week? Is it, is it fights with your spouse or with your kids? Or maybe you have memories of growing up and every Sunday it, w- it was a fight with your parents. Is it a particular type of clothes? I met a gentleman this morning who, this is his first time here, and he's like, I don't even know if I'm dressed right. And I was, some asked, he just moved into town, and he asked some people, like, where could I go to church? And he said, hey, there's this one up the hill, take a left. And he said, yeah, but I don't know if I'm dressed right. And he said, oh, they're the type, they don't care how you're dressed. And I went, yes. I don't really know who they are, but yes. What comes to mind for you? I'll bet you a building is at the top of the list. And I think the question that we have to ask this morning is, is how did this vibrant, organic movement called the church, how did it come to be associated with a building? Because if you step back from the church's story and remove the part about Jesus being God, which I I don't feel like I want to do, but if you just look at it from a secular historian's point of view, think of this. It, It was started by a rabbi who claimed to be God, who ultimately went to the cross. And when he went to the cross, mind you, the only person there, minus one or two friends, was his mom. And it's pretty safe to sell, tell that like, it doesn't really matter who you are, like, no matter how good or bad you are, if you go to the cross, your mom's going to be there. So that doesn't necessarily tell us much about him, right? He, he went to the cross. His, his followers were dejected when he was crucified. A few days later, to the shock and dismay of everyone involved, he, he rose from the dead. And from there, from a secular historian's point of view, what happened was this Jewish sect began to believe, they they adopted this idea that that Jesus had really rose from the dead, that he rose in bodily form, that it was a physical, historical event. And from there, this this sect of Jewish men and women, that they literally gave their lives to, to moving this story about Jesus and the implications of that. They were immediately a threat to their Jewish brethren and thus persecuted by them. The Roman Empire very quickly hated them for reasons we'll talk about more. It was incredibly dangerous, if not downright illegal, to be a Christian. And yet, despite all of this effort from the most powerful kingdom in the world at that time, they couldn't squelch it to the point that that they became famous for, for their service. And yet, here we are, 2,000 years removed from that, And if not you, certainly the people that you sit in a cubicle next to, certainly the people you serve coffee to, certainly the people who you go to class with and play football with, if you ask them what's a church, they would reference a building. And the question is, how in the world did that happen? Because it's not how it started. And to get at that question requires that we go back all the way to Jesus' years of earthly ministry. Because see, while Jesus was on the planet uh, teaching and leading, the question was, who is this guy? Is he a prophet? Is he a teacher? Is he insane? Is he an entertainer? Is he a miracle worker? Like, who is this guy? Is he from God? Is he God? Or is he just endued with God's power? I mean, clearly he had power over nature. I don't know how you could have argued with that when you watch some of the things. But from where does he, where does he get his power over nature from? And it didn't really matter whether you were a Jewish official or a, a, a priest or a Roman official or, or a prostitute, or, or a, or a non-Jewish farmer. The question was, who is he? And why won't he just come out and tell us? Well, eventually he did come out and tell us, so to speak, and, and that happened at a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, uh, before we jump into that, I just want to give you a little context of Caesarea Philippi. There are two Caesareas in, in Israel at this time. One is on the coast. It's a, it's a port town. It's a fascinating town because like, they, they just built the town. I mean, they, they did things that we couldn't even do today in, in our uh, architectural and engineering type of things. They were pouring concrete, and it was, just, it was crazy. You can still go there, and there's white marble washed up all over the beach there. There's another Caesarea that was in northern Israel, uh, at the kind of the outskirts of modern Israel. That's the one we're going to talk about. And that Caesarea, at the time uh, prior to Jesus, it, it was just a little outpost. It was, it was a pretty insignificant place, though it did have a pretty significant mountain. And Caesar Augustus, Caesar Augustus gave that region to Herod. So Herod was essentially the, the ruler of that part of the Roman kingdom. And mind you, 
we'll talk more about this in December, Herod, some say, some historians argue that Herod was the richest man to ever walk the planet. Not in his day, but there are, there are arguments that Herod, even when compared to guys like Bill Gates and, and, and the oil czars of Saudi Arabia, was the richest man to ever live on the planet. And so if you're Caesar, it's kind of good to have that guy on your team. And so Herod was gifted Caesarea by Caesar Augustus in an effort to say to Herod, thank you for your loyalty. Now, just to kind of show you why that relationship was intact, Herod responded to that by building a temple, a, a place of worship. And, and you're looking at the remains of it. It would have been built into the side, li- side of the mountain there uh, before the days of LED lights and projectors and screens and smoke machines and things like that it used white marble. And it became a very beautiful, very orna- ornate temple where people would come and, and they, would, they would have sex with child prostitutes and there was bestiality and it was this, this kind of classic Roman worship experience. And there they came to worship the god, Caesar Augustus. So you kind of see how that relationship worked. Eventually Herod died and Herod, that part of his kingdom was left into the control of one of his sons named Philip. And Philip took that region and added to it. He, he went from moving it kind of an outpost with a worship center to, to making it a very ornate city and eventually the capital of his particular region of the world. So it was in that region of the world where Jesus, the, the text in Matthew 16 picks up, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, maybe even you can imagine this, this temple looming over his shoulder as he asked them this question, who do the people say the son of man is? Now, mind you, son of man was a term used for Caesar as well. So, so was Savior, so was Lord, so was Prince of Peace. We'll talk about that in December. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Uh, what's the word on the street? Like, what are people saying? What are the blogs saying? What are the books saying? I mean, when you Google it, what are they saying? And they say, uh, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So they, they just kind of tell him what he asked. Like, here's, here's what we're hearing. And then he says, uh, but what about you? Like, who, who, who do you say? What about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? To which Simon Peter, which was his role, jumps right out of the gates and says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. To which Jesus said this, "Uh, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, capturing the, the mystery of salvation, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, uh, Petros, we have reason to believe that his name was Rocky before this moment. And he kind of captures who he was, like, you're Rocky. And if you're familiar with the Gospels, that's very much the personality of Peter. You are rocky, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, if you're someone who writes in your Bible or writes in your circles things on your, on your screen, on your phone, that there is the first, that there, them there mountains. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, That there is the first instance of church in your English Bible. The first time that word shows up. And what's beautiful about this passage is Jesus makes a promise there that you're a part of. Because what he says is, I'm going to do something. I'm going to create something. And nothing is going to prevent me from doing so. Nothing. And of course, what he's affirming here is that Peter's statement that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, something that bumps right up against what they said about Caesar, but that Jesus was that guy, that statement, he says, will be the foundation of what I'm about to do. And of course, 2,000 years of church history confirms that that's about the only thing we local churches can agree on, is that Jesus is the Messiah, the, the, the Son of God, the Savior. Now, uh, in this day, in the millennia, excuse me, before this day, before concrete was, was invented, if you're going to build a building, use stone. And mind you, that these, these people, uh, they, they were, were incredibly accomplished stonemasons. I don't know if you can picture when you see like some Roman column or something like that from this era, but what you have to remember is they didn't have CAD drawings and they didn't have lasers. They had men with like chisels. They were incredibly good at going to a mountainside like the one at Caesarea Philippi and creating from it a a 30, 40 foot column. In fact, one of the things that captures it very well is today in the modern Temple Mount that there are these massive stones that that form up the foundation stones underneath the ground. And they've unearthed a particular tunnel underneath them. And what they found is that there are these stones that, that weigh as much and greater than 250 tons. One stone. 
add to that the fact that, that they say that there are but a couple, if any, things on the planet today that could move them. And yet the historian Josephus tells us that while Herod was constructing the temple, while that thing was being constructed, not, not the sound of a chisel could be heard in Jerusalem. So you have these massive stones buried in the ground there, and yet they weren't created there. They, they weren't chiseled there. They were chiseled somewhere else and moved into place. And here's what's significant to me is, is today you can go there and you can't fit a credit card between two of them. Incredibly skilled craftsmen. And Jesus draws upon that culture and he says, that statement will be the cornerstone of my building. The first stone laid, the one upon which everything else will be measured. That's what I'm going to do. It's this play on words with with Peter and his nickname and this idea of, of building in the day. But what's easily missed, and what I didn't fully appreciate until uh, uh, a guy named Andy Stanley wrote a book and unpacked some of this, what's easily missed then is the meaning of the word church and the word that's actually behind the word church. Because see, the Greek word behind our English word church is the word ekklesia. I try it. Since everyone else has accents, you get to, too. Say ecclesia. Ecclesia means gathering. It means congregation. It means movement. It means a people. It was a civic term. It was more a civic term or a secular term in this day than it was a religious one. It referred to a, a group of soldiers who were called out for a particular uh, mission. It referred to a, a school board meeting. It referred to a a gathering of people that had a specific purpose for that gathering. It did not, however, refer to a building or anything close to it. Jesus' Jewish audience would have also recognized the the word from their Greek uh, Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible. See, years prior to this, they began to recognize that, man, people are speaking Greek now. Less Hebrew, more Greek. And there was this conversation of like, hey, we think maybe we should translate the scriptures into Greek so that people can read them. And they went, no, 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 we can't do that. That'd be sacrilegious. Like, everyone should read from the King James Version forever. And they said, no, 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 let's, let's put it into Greek. It was this controversial thing. And they, in fact, did translate the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And it came to be known as the Septuagint. Well, ecclesia is actually the word used in the Septuagint to, to communicate the ancient people of Israel. When it's talking about these people who were rescued from Egypt, when it's talking about these people who wandered around the wilderness for 40 years, when it's talking about these people who their temple was destroyed and they were scattered across the world, it was, they referred to as the ecclesia. Not the temple, different word used for that. Not the tabernacle, different word used for that. The people, the movement, the idea. And so from both a sacred and secular standpoint, Jesus uses here a word that has nothing to do with architecture and everything to do with people and mission. And if you're not sleeping yet, which I wouldn't know because I can't see you, though it would be fun to start falsely accusing some of you, if you're with me still, the question becomes, okay, so how in the world did, did, did ecclesia come to mean a building? And the answer to that question gets at the heart of how in the world did a, did a Jewish sect who, who became deeply convinced that Jesus was God, who, who died believing that he was God, in fact, who died claiming they knew he was God because they saw it, how did that come to be associated with particular buildings? The answer gets at, like, how, how, did, it become, how did a movement become an institution? Now, let me s- say this just kind of before we take another step. I do not want to be understood this morning as suggesting that that in any ways we're better because we don't have a building and that buildings are therefore wrong. That's not the conclusion here at all. Our friends at Journey and Harvest and Billings, uh, I think uh, they they demonstrate very well how to effectively be an ecclesia with a building. So so that's not where I'm going. But nonetheless, the question still remains, how how did the movement, this organic ragtag group of people, how did it come to be associated with stained glass and big old fancy buildings? And to get there, we've got to jump forward about 250 years to the, to the year A.D. 313. Because in A.D. 313, Constantine did something unthinkable prior to this. In A.D. 313, Constantine declared Christianity to be legal. Now, technically what he did was he, he, what he declared was the freedom of all religion, but that had particular relevance for Christianity. Because prior to this time, of course, being a Christian was, was not only illegal, it was incredibly dangerous. The reason was because the, the, the Romans very clearly stated that, that Caesar Augustus or whatever Caesar was on the planet was God in the flesh. That's why they called him the son of God. And the Christians went, no, no, no. Caesar's not the son of God. Jesus 
is the son of God. The, the Romans said, Caesar, he, he's prince of peace. And they went, no, 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 Jesus is prince of peace. They, they said, Caesar is king. And they went, no, 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 Jesus is king. And the result of that was incredible persecution, well documented in your uh, late forays on the History Channel during the reigns of guys like Nero and, and Domitian. But even in the more friendly of emperors, it was brutal. Christians during this season were not allowed to own property. They they weren't allowed to hold public office or to have any kind of position of prominence. They they were falsely accused and arrested for crimes with regularity. They they were incredibly marginalized and discriminated against within their communities. In many cases, they weren't even allowed to go to, to vans because people who wanted to shop at vans had to demonstrate as they walked through the door that they worshiped Caesar. And so they had to create their own systems of even providing food and water and things like that and medical care for themselves. But then all of a sudden, Domitian comes along and he says it's okay to be a Christian. And they say historically, initially, it did nothing. And then, shortly thereafter, Domitian proclaimed himself to be a Christian. And you can imagine the shockwaves that created. That this now emperor of Rome who was in the line of emperors trying to squelch out this movement, is now claiming to be a part of it. And what happened historically was was being a Christian became uh, very fashionable. What you may call in vogue, cool, hip. All the hipsters became Christ followers. Now, prior to Constantine, Christian worship was incredibly informal. They, they, They would gather in homes and they would eat meals. They would gather in different homes. You wouldn't have associated them w- w- with a home. You would have associated them with like, how do we figure out what, 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 what are we doing? They would have had meals. They would have sang hymns. They would have read scripture. They'd have talked theology. They'd have taken communion. It was, it was incredibly simple. After Constantine, they, they started to, to meet in buildings. After Constantine, they started to use things like really fancy clothing After Constantine, they started to to adapt more and more of what they call the Roman cult religions into the Christian practice, things like incense and and choirs and any number of different kind of formal, systematic types of practices. And some of you are going, wow, this is ironic. I know. See, before Constantine, they they made a habit of, of gathering at the place of a martyr and they would celebrate a martyr's death that someone who had died for the faith in this simplistic kind of gathering. After Constantine, massive buildings were built on top of those very sites. And today, should you ever get the incredible privilege to to go to Israel, you'll see these massive buildings that still are built over the top of where the original cave was supposed to be, built over the top of where these significant things or significant people claimed to have died. See, the point is that in very short time, in fact, in a span of 10 years or less, the movement became an institution. The movement came to to be a building. And the problem is, uh, you can't lock the door on an ecclesia, but you can lock the door on a building. And in fact, the fact that the, the mindset of what the church is shifted is reflected in their language because, okay, so most of your Bible... Is, is a, in most of your English Bible is a word-for-word word or idea-by-idea by idea translation from Greek into English. Not so with church. When you get to the word church, it's not a translation, it's a substitution. And what I'm going to argue is a bad one at that. See, the Latin word that began to be substituted there, and here's how we know how the mentality changed within these 10 years after Constantine's declaration, the Latin word... It didn't have anything to do with gathering or a people. The Latin word that they used was the word basilica. And a basilica is a religious building. In the Gothic German world that was already heavily Christianized and became more so, the the word that they would use in this passage had nothing to do with congregation or assembly or or people. It was the word karaka, which, which they translated as house of the Lord. See, within 10 years, the entire mentality shifted from movement to institution. And as I've already said, that the trouble is, you can lock the door on a basilica. You can lock the door on a caraca. In fact, with a caraca, if you can lock the door, you can control it. And if you can control the building, the caraca, you can even control the scriptures, which in fact we we know happened because in the the Middle Ages... uh, the, the, the Bible, the, the scriptures that they did have were chained to the pulpit, which means you could only access them if you were in the building. 
Now, I want to be clear on this. I, I have some really good friends, one of them I run with almost every Monday, who are deeply abiding Catholic people. So please don't hear me in any way taking shots at Catholicism. I think to read these stories and to hear these stories and to conclude, ah, those idiots, I think it's to completely miss the point. Just like to read the stories in the New Testament of the Pharisees and conclude, ah, those hypocrites, I would have never done that, is to completely miss the role of the Pharisees in the scriptures. The role is not that you would suddenly see someone that you're better than, that the role is to, to see them and to see what you're prone to do and who you're prone to become. And I think the same is true when we engage church history. It is not, it is so easy to point a finger back at church history and somehow use it to load our anti-Catholic guns, which I don't own one. It's so much harder to go, man, this, this, is, this is our tendencies. To take something that's supposed to be a movement and raw and organic and turn it into something we can control oh so easily. But as the language shifted to capture the idea of building, we do most certainly enter into some really dark years in church history. And yet the great thing is, Jesus was faithful. And we know looking back that he did the very thing he said he would do at Caesarea Philippi, that he would continue to lead his church. Which brings us to about 1433 or 1452. What does it say? 53. Wow. See, I can't read it. In 1453... Uh, something happened that for the Roman Empire was devastating. In 1453, Constantinople uh, was, was ransacked by the Ottoman Empire. In 1453, the, the death knell of the Roman Empire really hit a high note. And in 1453, when Constantinople fell, the other thing that happened was the seat of religious and civic authority within the Roman Empire, empire was toppled. But what was seen to be a really, really negative thing for Rome became a really positive thing for the ecclesia. Because the scholars and the remnant of people who understood what God was trying to do and the leaders, they began to understand that their, their manuscripts, these sacred texts, these old texts were in grave danger. That, that with the, with the uh, destruction of Constantinople also came the destruction of its culture. And so they began to look for safe haven and they eventually would flee west to Europe, to places like modern day England and Germany. And there they found uh, friends, friends who were asking some of the same questions, questions that were born out of the Enlightenment, questions that were born out of all that was happening culturally at that time. They were starting to ask questions like, wait wait, wait a minute, why does he get the last word? Why don't the scriptures? Wait, wait, Wait a minute, why do only they get to read the scriptures? Why don't we fire up Gutenberg's contraption and make it so that everybody can read the scriptures? Why are they only written in a language that's already archaic? Why don't we make it accessible to the people? And what was born in that season was this abiding desire to re-engage the scriptures. And one guy in particular, a guy named by the name of William Tyndale, he was an Englishman, he began to suggest that maybe the scriptures should be translated into everyday English. And his English counterparts they, they couldn't believe the audacity. And the combination of the threat between the Church of England uh, as well as the Catholic Church made his life in grave danger. And he fled to Germany, and there he finished his project. He retranslated the scriptures into everyday English. He distributed them in underground fashion. And eventually he was captured, having been branded a heretic. He was tied with a rope to a pole. He was then choked to death. And then he and the pole and the rope were burned. And they were so disgusted and demonstrating their disgust that they then took what remained of him and just scattered it. But as people started to read their English Bibles, as people started to re-engage the scriptures, they began to understand that the church of that century looked quite different than the church of the first century. And where it really stood out to them was when they got into Matthew 16 and Jesus said, hey, uh, Peter, I'm going to build my church on that statement. What what they didn't run into was basilica. What they didn't run into was caraca. What they didn't run into was building or even the word church. What they ran into was the word congregation. And William Tyndale did something very intentional in order to return people's understanding of church from building to movement and mission, he re-engaged them with the word congregation. And while the word church was 
just so there that it stuck, the movement hit a new high note. Now, obviously, I think all of this raises some really heavy questions for all of us. And trust me when I say, like, I, I feel the giant spotlight on, on me and us and this place. I think it raises questions like, so, so are we a movement? Or do we just host services? Like, are we making a tangible difference to the community around us? Are we a people on mission? Or are we just a Sunday an hour on Sunday? Are, are, are we ecclesia or are we caraca? And I think those very same questions can c- translate to your own engagement with Jesus. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.